The Earth is old. Very, very old. This is not a faith-based position, but a matter of fact. Geologists, paleontologists, and biologists can reliably demonstrate that the Earth is incredibly old, far older than 10,000 years. Here we will look at the underlying idea behind an old Earth, and then we will discuss different ways we can know that the Earth is old. This underlying idea is called uniformitarianism, and it can be summarized in its modern form as the age old, the present is the key to the past. In other words, we can look at natural processes happening today and infer that they occurred in the past. On the surface, the idea seems pretty basic, but it is a fighting term to creationists. However, regardless of what creationists believe, the idea that the Earth is very old is very well supported. English geologist James Hutton first developed the idea of uniformitarianism, although the term was not coined by him. His definitive evidence of the process was that of Sicker Point. This is a geological formation on the east coast of Scotland that is known as an angular unconformity because it contains two strata separated by an eroded layer. The lower strata is Silurian Greywack, and the upper strata is Devonian Red Sandstone. The middle layer, though, is Silurian Basal Conglomerate, which is the eroded rock. In essence, the Silurian rock was laid down, eroded over millions of years, and then the Devonian rock was laid down later. This is clear support of uniformitarianism, as we know from observations that the erosion of large strata takes many years, and yet there is much more evidence of an old earth. Next, let us look at geomagnetic reversals in the Atlantic Ocean. In the episode titled Biogeography, I explained that all the land masses on Earth were once conjoined into one supercontinent called Pangaea, and even creationists agree that Pangaea existed, thus I think we can spare arguing for its existence. However, Pangaea was not the only supercontinent to form in Earth's history. There was also Valbara, Kenorland, Columbia, Rodinia, and Panosha. Quite a collective of evidence supports the existence of each supercontinent, so why do creationists only accept the existence of Pangaea? For instance, strata in Australia and South Africa attest to Valbara having formed in the past, around 3.6 billion years ago. We cannot simply accept Pangaea without all the others. However, that presents quite a problem for creation and flood geology, as it implies that the continents were drifting wildly before settling down, presumably post-flood. Anyway, Pangaea drifted apart, carrying North and South America on one side and Afro-Eurasia and Australia on the other. Antarctica went its own way. This is due to the convective churning of the Earth's mantle, which is liquid. The mantle takes material from the lithosphere, which is the upper hard part of the Earth, and eventually returns it to the surface in the form of magma. The magma hits the water and cools, forming basalt and gabbro where the plates meet, and this whole process is called seafloor spreading. When the basalt is made, it acts like a camera of the Earth's magnetic field, taking a picture of which direction the magnetic poles lie. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a great example of this process, and what makes it even more interesting is that when the basalt forms, the magnetic snapshots are symmetrical on both sides of the ridge. What they show is that the magnetic poles of the Earth have reversed many, many times over the millions of years, and the reversals certainly did not cause the extinction of all life, as some think they should. Now, with an old Earth, geomagnetic reversals are easy to explain, but not so with a young Earth. If the Earth were young, then creationists would have to explain why the Earth's magnetic poles flipped extremely rapidly in the past, but not in the present. In the past 83 million years alone, the magnetic poles have reversed 184 times. Creationists have absolutely no explanation for how poles could have reversed super quickly so many times in the past, but slowed down for the present. We can also look at selenite megacrystals. In the Naca mine in Chihuahua, Mexico, these megacrystals grow at 1.4 times 10 to the negative 5th nanometers per second, or 1.4 times 10 to the negative 14th meters per second. Since some of the crystals are 12 meters long, we can use the distance equation to determine approximately how long the formation of such crystals took. Distance equals rate times time, so 12 meters equals 1.4 times 10 to the negative 14th meters per second times time, which will give us the number of seconds. That gives us 8.6 times 10 to the negative 14 seconds, and dividing that by the number of seconds in a year would give us the number of years involved. 
there are 3.154 times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year, so dividing 8.6 times 10 to the 14th by 3.154 times 10 to the 7 gives us 27,176,374 years. That is substantially longer than the young Earth timescale allows. Lastly, we will investigate manganese nodules. Manganese nodules are concretions of manganese hydroxides and iron around a core rock, and these, like the selenite megacrystals, grow extremely slowly. The slower end of manganese nodules grow at or below 10 millimeters per million years, while faster ones can grow between 10 and 100 millimeters per million years. With that in mind, areas like the oceanic clarion clipperton zone possess 21 billion tons of manganese nodules, which implies a time scale, again, far longer than the young Earth model could allow. All of these different independent lines of evidence lead one to conclude that the Earth is incredibly old. Sicker Point shows that uniformitarianism is true, and geomagnetic reversals, selenite megacrystals, and manganese nodules attest to an old Earth. We could have gone still further, pointing out the existence of varves, which are annual layers of sedimentary rock, rock strata formed only by wind, like the Coconino sandstone, rock strata formed only by long periods of evaporation, like salt and travertine, annual tree rings, annual snow ice cycles, index fossils, the rate at which corals grow, and the fact that mutation rates only allow for so much variation within a certain time period which shows both that the time period in which genetic variation can accrue and when distinct lineages converge on common ancestors. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.